Well, good morning. This is an unusual place for me to be, so. <laughs> Thank you, Jeff. Upon this rock, I will build my church. In Matthew 28, Jesus, or Matthew 16, Jesus is walking with the disciples. And he turns to them and he says, But who do you say I am? Simon Peter answered, You are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And Jesus said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, because flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. I also say to you that you are Peter, and upon this rock I will build my church, and the gate of hell will not overpower it. What a wonderful thing upon this rock. The answer to that question of who do you say I am? Rest our eternity where we will spend our forever. Peter had the right answer, but it wasn't flesh and blood. It wasn't time with Jesus that it revealed to him. It was the Father in heaven that had revealed it to him. And Christ changes his name to Peter. And he tells him that it's not flesh and blood, but my Father that revealed it to you. And upon this rock, I will build my church. But don't get confused. The rock is not Peter. The rock is the gospel. Jesus is going to build his church upon the gospel. And what is the gospel? As Pastor Doug shared with us last week, short version of what is the gospel? Three words, God saves sinners. There's a lot more to it, but there's nothing less than God saves sinners. So we are in our third week of this series. We actually are finally going to get into the first topic of the toolkit. But before we do that, we're going to take a little review of the last couple of weeks. So two weeks ago, Doug taught on the disciple. And in our toolkit it says, if you are a follower of Christ, you are a disciple of our Savior. You are his pupil. You are his student. You are his learner in the faith. As his, we know him to be Lord and desire to be obedient to his call on our lives. But a disciple who is not discipling is not a disciple. And in my preparation this week, I came across this definition of a disciple. A disciple in the ancient biblical world actively imitated both the life and the teaching of the master. It was a deliberate apprenticeship which made the fully formed disciple a living copy of the master. And isn't that what we all as believers strive to be, to be fully formed in the image of Christ. We can't do that this side of heaven, but is what we should be driving for. To be a disciple, a copy of Christ as he walked on earth. In fact, in 1 John, it even tells us, by this we may know that we are in him, Whoever says he abides in him ought to walk in the same way in which he walked. So we are to be a copy. We are to imitate Christ. We are to be in his image. But as we go along on this walk of being a disciple of Christ, we have a command. And we looked at that a couple of weeks ago that we are supposed to be making disciples. Matthew 28. Go therefore and make disciples of all the nations, baptizing them in the name of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit, teaching them to observe all that I commanded you. And lo, I am with you always, even to the end of the age. And that, in a nutshell, is what we want to accomplish 
here at Cornerstone through this toolkit series. We want to help us be better disciples so that we can go out and make disciples. Now, each week we will touch on a topic. Today, as, as Jeff already said, we're looking at things of God. And we will have a fundamental thought that goes with that topic. We'll also have a main passage for the topic. However, there's no way for me or Pastor Doug to get up here and cover everything on a topic on a Sunday morning. And that's where, as Jeff said, the toolkit comes in. That's where your daily reading and responding to the Word of God comes in. That's where you're going to read the rest of the story. That's going to help you round out the understanding of that topic. So that what? So that you can share or impart that knowledge with someone else. Now, I have a friend for many years. We, we meet every Sunday morning for probably now the last 20 plus years. And he used to teach our Sunday school class at NCC, our adult Sunday school class. And he had a, kind of, a term that he loved to use in class called Christian constipation. Man, what's that mean? That's all of us that come, sit in those chairs, the pews, sit in a study group, Sunday school class, and all we do is feed me, feed me, feed me, feed me. We take in the word, but we never do anything with it. So we're challenging you through this toolkit to not only take in the word, but as, as Pete so beautifully described in, in just a casual happening there in a the Starbucks, use the word that God has hidden in you and get it out. So Then last week, Pastor Doug taught on the church. So what is the church? A local group of disciples, supernaturally saved, fit together, and filled up by the spirit of the living God. Now, we see in scripture that it tells us we should be gathered together as believers. In Hebrews 10, we read, and let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together, as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another all the more as you see the day drawing near. So when we gather together today, like today, in our corporate worship, what we call church, and it doesn't have to look like cornerstone. There are local churches all over the globe gathering together. They look different, but when they are gathering together and worshiping God, a group of unlike people worshiping one God, we put God on display. But for some, the local church has become a social club, a place where we come to get rather than give. A place where we come to be served instead of to serve. So how do we combat that in the church? And Pastor Doug talked last week and you got a handout and in your toolkit back on page 179 in the back of it, there is a section to help you because maybe you're struggling and you say, what is my gift? I don't know what my gift has been. I don't know how to, how to use it because I don't know what it is. Get into the toolkit. Get into the appendix there. Look at some of the tools. Discover what is your spiritual gift. Along with that, and these are available on the back table. They're handed out in the insert last week, but they're back on the back table. It's just an insert showing you all of the opportunities to engage and use your spiritual gift. And I'll put in another little plug, whether it be helping the, the music team tear down afterwards or it be helping Eric's team 
you know, tear down afterwards. Places to use your spiritual gift. Because we are all gifted differently. And the whole body is only the whole body when all the parts are working together. And that's why we're not to neglect meeting together. And more importantly, that's why you're missed when you're not here. Your gift is not here. Your smile, your helping hand, whatever it is, your gift is not here when you're not here. So, like I say, get in the toolkit, find what your gift is, find where you can serve, and use that gift. In fact, 1 Corinthians tells us that the Holy Spirit displays God's power through each of us as a means of helping the entire church. So you all gifted, you've all got a gift, it all fits together, all works together to make us whole for the entire church. And lastly, as I talk about the church from last week, um, Doug used a Spurgeon quote that I really like. If I had never joined a church till I had found one that was perfect, I should never have joined one at all. And the moment I did join it, I should have spoiled it. For it would have not been perfect church after I became a member of it. Still, imperfect as it is, it is the dearest place on earth to us. It is where we corporately gather together to worship our Lord. So, all that to say, we are to be disciples, we're to be making disciples, and we're to gather together as the church. So where does that start? And it starts with you having an understanding of where you are on a spiritual journey with Jesus. But it's much more than that. Parents, do you know where your children are on their spiritual journey with church, with Jesus? And I'm going to take a moment to tell you why that particular one is really important and share with you personally our son Brandon junior senior high years of high school every appearance was that he was walking with Christ he had done a tour across the country singing with a Christian group he was journaling his prayer journal uh, he knew the language he knew what to say much like maybe Many of our ch your children might be, the outward appearance, they appeared to be a Christian, appeared to have a faith, a faith of their own. But our son Brandon prayed to, uh, years later, I, I didn't know this at the time, years later I found his journal and he literally was praying for, as he headed to U of A for the Lord to give him somebody that needed to see Christ. And it certainly sounds like somebody that's ready to share their faith, right? And he got the prayer answered because he got the actual practicing active, active Satanist as a roommate. But what we came to find out and what I'm pleading with you as parents, his faith was that of his parents, that of his teachers in his Christian school, that of somebody else because it wasn't his faith. And it didn't take long until he wasn't practicing his faith at all. And it breaks our heart. And it's still our prayer that he will, that God will open his eyes and bring him back. But it's been 20 some years. So, parents, take this opportunity with the toolkit. Talk to your kids. Find out if their faith is their faith and not your faith. That their walk is their walk. So I'll get off my soapbox now, but I just, I charge you with that. It's been on my heart since the day we came to Cornerstone. Because there's so many young families here. That, uh, so be with your, talk to your children. Find out where they are. But don't stop there. 
as Pete has obviously demonstrated, as Jeff talked about, you know, where's your neighbor? Where's your coworker? Where are your friends? Students, where are your fellow students? Where are all these people that God has put deliberately in your life? Where are they on this spiritual journey? And when you're with these people, are you taking the opportunity, are you finding the opportunity to ask questions? Ask them if they're thinking about the things of God. And when you do, are you prepared, like Pete, excellent job, like Pete, are you prepared to take them and start maybe making a disciple of them? So, okay. So let's look at our text and let's see what what God has for us this morning. Open your Bibles, if you haven't already, to John 14. John is the fourth book of the New Testament, Matthew, Mark, Luke, John. If you get to Acts, you've gone a little too far, just back up. And the question for today, do you know the way to God? And I added the tag afterwards to it, why does that matter? Now, as I said earlier, we will have every week a fundamental thought. That is what we'll lead into the topic with. And today's fundamental thought from page 21 of the toolkit says, we are all three-dimensional beings, body, soul, and spirit. As Christians, we believe that until we know Christ, we are spiritually dead and living, controlled by our flesh and our mind, will, and emotions. We're also all on a spiritual journey and have an eternal destiny and destination. The only question is address. Some may be sure multiplying followers of Christ. Others may be simply seeking to learn more about who Jesus is as God opens their hearts to his truth. But the only way to come to know the truth is to come to a saving knowledge of Jesus Christ and be made alive in his spirit. The question of this life and your eternal life is, where are you on this journey with Jesus? So today we're gonna take a look at four points. It'll go fairly quickly. First point would be believe in God and you will know the way. He made the way so that you would know the way. He is showing the truth that you will show the truth, the way. And now life in him and live, excuse me, now live in him and you will show the way. So starting in verse four, or chapter 14, verse one, Believe in God and you will know the the way. Let not your hearts be troubled. Believe in God. Believe also in me. In my father's house are many whole rooms. If it were not so, would I have told you that I go to prepare a place for you? And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and will take you to myself, that where I am, you may be also. And you know the way you know the way to where I am going. So to set the scene for this, the disciples, there's now 11 of them. Judas has has left the upper room. They're still in the upper room. Judas has left to go betray Jesus. And Jesus is with the 11 disciples. And in chapter 13, he has just told them, I am going away and you can't follow me. Now these are guys that have been following him for three years And he's telling them, I'm going away and you can't follow me. So their hearts are troubled. And how do we overcome a troubled heart? Believe, believe in God. And he tells them, believe in God. And what he's saying is now, not only believe in me, but now believe that I have fulfilled my promise of a Messiah in Jesus. But he doesn't leave them there. He does tell him he's going away, but he'll come again, which is good news for all of us, because he will come again. And they, like us, will be with him. So let me ask you, do you believe that Jesus has fulfilled 
the promise of God of a, for a savior. That is the way to God. It's not your behavior. It's not your works. It's just believe. In fact, John 3.16, which is a verse that we're all so familiar with, most of us can probably quote it. But sometimes that familiarity works against us because we don't really hear what the words are. And it's very simple. For God so loved the world that he gave his only son that whoever believes in him should not perish but have eternal life. So, believe in God Believe he fulfilled his promise with Jesus. So our second point we'll look at is he made the way so that you will know the way. And picking back up in the text, in verse 5, Thomas said to him, Lord, we do not know where you are going. How can we know the way? Jesus said to him, I am the way the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. If you had known me, you would have known my Father also. From now on, you do know him and have seen him. Know him, and you will know the Father. I am the way. He's making it clear that if these 11 men know him, they know the Father. They've seen him, they've seen the Father. The Father is in him. But he tells them, I am the way. How did he make that way? On the cross. He took his life on the cross to make a way for us to be able to have a relationship with God took his death on the cross to take away our sins that would make a way for us to get to God. Hebrews 10 tells us, Therefore, brothers, since we have confidence to enter the holy place by the blood of Jesus, Amen. by the new and living way that he opened for us through the curtain, that is, through his flesh, his flesh on the cross. And he can't make it any more clear than when he said, no one comes to the Father except through me. He is the way. So we looked at to believe in God and you will know the way. He made the way so that you would know the way. You remember our question of the day, do you know the way to God? I think we can answer that at this point, that the way to God is Jesus. Why does it matter? And what should we do with it? So let's look at our third point. He is showing the truth that you will show the way. Again, picking it back up in the text, verse 8. Philip said to him, Lord, show us the Father, and it is enough for us. Jesus said to him, have I been with you so long and you still do not know me, Philip? Whoever has seen me has seen the Father. How can you say, show us the Father? Do you not believe that I am the Father and the Father is in me? The words that I say to you, I do not speak on my own authority, but the Father who dwells in me does his works. Believe me that I am in the Father and the Father is in me or else believe on the account of the works themselves. So you can see, Philip asked this question, you know, he makes this statement, show us the Father and we will believe. And you can, you can probably just picture Jesus, saying, Philip, you've been with me three years. You don't know yet. You've been in my presence so long. By now, you should be helping to show the Father. But, as we've learned here and in other pieces of Scripture, the disciples were a lot like us, or at least a lot like me, a little on the slow learner side. It took them a while. 
They don't know at this point. They also don't have the Holy Spirit at this point. Because look what happens once they have the Holy Spirit. It comes a short time later in Acts 4. At Pentecost, they've received the Spirit. And then now, now when they saw the boldness of Peter and John and perceived that they were uneducated, common men, they were astonished. And they recognized they had been with Jesus. Now, tell you my own little personal story with that. Again, I mentioned my friend that I get together with on Sunday mornings, and there's another one that Tom unfortunately went to be with the Lord almost two years ago after a long battle with cancer. But seven years ago, we started leadership development here at. Uh, Cornerstone. And I was in that class. And Tom, who at that time had been around me for 15 years, I mean, we were together every Sunday morning. We were in what we would call core groups here. We were in a small group together. We were in Sunday school class together. We were in church together. And we did life together. So Tom knew, Tom knew me, knew pretty, pretty well who I was. And we're about six months into that leadership development. And where it's intense, we're in the Word every day. We're memorizing Scripture. We're you know, studying it. And Tom comes to me one day and says, he knew I was in the class, and he says, I see a difference in you. I see more Jesus. Threw me for a loop. But I remembered one of the verses we had studied in class. And this is time with God will show. You know, it showed, it showed on Moses when he came back down off the mountain, right? So a little different. He would just glowed with Jesus. But time with the Lord will make a difference in your life. And it took a, an outside person looking at my life for me to realize how valuable that time in the word was for me. And he finishes that section saying that you still don't believe. So I've told you, I've told you I'm in the way, I've told you I'm in the Father, the Father's in me, and you still don't believe me. Believe in the works I have done. And did he accomplish those works on his own? No, we read in John 5, but the testimony that I have is greater than that of John. For the works that the Father has given me to accomplish, the very works that I am doing, bear witness about me that the Father has sent me. So if nothing else, these, look at the works that he has done. And no, it's not the works, it's the works that he did for the Father. The Father had sent him. So, believe God Believe he has fulfilled the promise in Jesus and you will know the way. How did he make the way on the cross? So how does he show us the truth that we can show others the truth? Right here. How do we spend time with Jesus now? The disciples got to spend time with him personally. How do we spend time with him? In the word. And I know, it's a soapbox type thing here in Cornerstone, but we will keep preaching and never be ashamed of preaching to be in the Word daily. But how do we show the way? So let's look at our last point. It'll go quickly. Picking the text up in verse 12. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever believes in me will also do the works that I do, and greater works than these will he do, because I am going to the Father. Whatever you ask in my name, this I will do, that the Father may be glorified in the Son. If you ask anything in my name, I will do it. If you love me, you will keep my commandments. So he has promised us that we will do greater works 
than him. Now, on the face of that, that sounds pretty bold. But when we do these greater works, they're for what? To put God on display. And how do we know? It's kind of interesting. Doug and Tony and I get together usually every week, talk about Doug's message normally. This week it was talking about my message. And the question came up. Who made more disciples? Jesus or Paul? Did Paul do in spiritual work greater works? Now, I'm not getting into all the theology of we know that no one comes to, the, comes to a faith except through Christ. But we also know from Matthew 28 that we are called to make disciples. And call, Paul was called to make disciples. He was making disciples. We are called to make disciples. We are called to do greater works. But again, we can't do that unless we're bold, like Pete was in the coffee shop, when somebody comes up to us and gives us that opportunity. Paul tells us in 1 Corinthians, he says, I am the least of the apostles, unworthy to be called an apostle because I persecuted the church of God. But by the grace of God, I am what I am. And his grace toward me was not in vain. On the contrary, I worked harder than any of them, though it was not I, but the grace of God that was with me. Whether then it was I or they, so we preached, and so you believed. So he promises us that if we're living in him, we can ask anything. But when we're asking him, are we asking for the things of God or the things of the flesh? Paul was asking for the things of God. And Paul showed the way to many. And you and I too can too. We have that same Holy Spirit living in us. We have the same opportunity to show people the way. In fact, in closing, I will challenge you. Can you say what Paul said in 1 Corinthians 11? Follow me as I follow Christ. Is there someone in your life that you can say that to? That you can say, come along, brother. Come along, sister. Follow me. Don't, don't, not for me. Follow me as I follow Christ. So, question of the day. How do we find Jesus? Do you know the way to God? It's through Jesus. Why does it matter? Because our eternity rests in it are forever rest in knowing the answer to finding God, and that is Christ. So, as the music team comes back up and the lights come down, we're going to have a time to respond. As the music team plays, uh, there will be a couple of couples in the back that you can go to for prayer if you have something to pray about. If you have somebody on your heart that needs prayer, that's here today, go over to them and pray with them right now. Sit here and soak in his love. And the final thing I thought I will leave you with, because God clobbered me with this in the middle of my study this week. You, me, can desire all the things of God. But if you don't obey his first command to love, you're bankrupt. So, in the midst of it all, don't forget, love. Let's pray. Heavenly Father, Lord, we thank you for today. We thank you that you did make a way 
We thank you that we can know that way. In fact, Lord, we can show others that way. And Lord, if we spend our time daily, regularly with you in the word and are conformed more and more into your image, Lord, then we can come along a brother, a sister, and say, follow me as I follow Christ. And we, we can have the boldness to go and make disciples as you've commanded us to. All, Lord, to one reason, and that is to bring you glory, to raise you on high. You're the only one that is worthy of our praise. In Jesus' name, amen.